Okay, why don't we, why don't we go ahead and get started? Yeah. Um, well, Anita is really the host and the moderator for tonight. Um, my name is Kay Ferguson. I'm with Artivism Virginia. And my job is to give you a little bit of a Zoom uh, guide here at the beginning. Most of you probably are very Zoom savvy by now. But if not, if you look at the bottom left of your Zoom screen, you will see a little microphone. And that's where you can mute and unmute yourself. So when it comes time for you to speak or ask a question, you have to unmute yourself in order to do so. And then it's kind of a good idea to mute yourself back just because, you know, children and dogs and unexpected explosions and things. Um, I think also people can see the little button that looks like a little dialogue bubble in the middle of your Zoom screen. That's the chat. And you can put things in the chat either to everyone um, or to a particular person in the meeting. And uh, we will be putting some links in there later for you to be able to connect with the February 8th public hearing on the air permit for the compressor station. Um, we are recording this meeting. And so if anyone feels uncomfortable with that, they can um, not join with video or um, change their name uh, to something silly. But uh, Anita thought it might be useful for us to have the recording to share um, with others who couldn't make it tonight later. So is that okay with everyone? Yeah, we have to look over here at the rest of you. No head shaking, everybody's thumbs up. All right, wonderful. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to tell you uh, was how to raise your hand when we come to the question and answer. If you look again in that little toolbar at the bottom, there's a button called reactions. And if you click that, you can see at the very bottom, you have the feature of raising your hand to speak. Um, and it's, you can do that or you can raise it on the screen if you're here on the screen. Um, and if none of that gets the right attention, then just wait for a pause and unmute yourself and weigh in. And welcome. Anita. Thank you much. Thank you for, well, isn't it nice bad all the time? Um, it's gas and we get a chance of meeting to meet out this evening. Well, the, we're here to, to answer the community questions, members' questions about the proposed Lambert MVP Southgate compressor station and to learn how to best participate in the February 8th public hearing, which you'll hear more about um, on the air permit for the station. And you're gonna, we'll be learning, I'm, I'm saying we, we will be learning uh, more about that so that we can be um, informed speakers when we make our comments. Um, we're gonna begin with um, Karen Kaplan and Karen, Karen, if you're, are you on the, is Karen on the line? Is Karen here? Yes, she's here. I'm on the line. Okay, let me introduce her. Um, Karen, Karen Kaplan is the Environment and Climate Justice Chair for the Virginia State Conference NAACP and the co-director of the Green New Deal Virginia Coalition. Karen provides resources to local address environment to improve quality of life, health, transformacy, and Karen is advocating production processes and discriminatory practices. She is also the co-chair of transportation for the Sierra Club, Virginia, and believes 
addressing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector is a crucial link towards building sustainability and equity in our communities. So welcome, Karen. Um, Karen, I'm just going to interrupt one more second. I forgot to tell the participants in your top right part of your screen where you see a little grid and you can choose view. If you click on that, you can choose to look at all of our lovely faces or you can choose speaker. And so if you want to hear the person speaking better or see their slides, you can choose speaker instead of gallery, which is probably what you're looking at right now. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell, and it is uh, President Royston has mentioned, I am the current um, Environmental and Climate Justice Chair for the Virginia State Conference and AACP. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of disclaimer right now. I, my internet is unstable, so if you see me turn my camera off, that just means that I'm seeing that I'm about to freeze. And please don't take it personally. I'll try and turn it back on as soon as I can. But um, and please, I have everybody on gallery, so if you can't hear me, if you see me freeze, just wave so I know. Well, I guess I'll be frozen. I won't, I won't see you wave, but uh, I'll try and, 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 and try and figure things out. But again, uh, my name is Karen, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background and overview of what the Environmental and Climate Justice Program is, and just talk briefly about environmental justice. So the Environmental and Climate Justice Program has been um, a part of the national program for about 11 years now. It was started to combat the ill effects of the coal industry and it has, and, and was a part of the Public Health Committee. Um, as the program started getting more involved in issues on both the local, state, and federal level, they realized just how important it was to be, advocate for um, clean water, clean land and clean air. And then it became a standalone um, uh, committee. And uh, two years ago, when they had their national conference in Detroit, the environmental and climate justice program was identified as a game changer for NAACP. And a game changer is an issue um, or a focus that is identified to have a significant influence and impact on the socioeconomic advancement of African American communities, um, black and brown communities, and everyone in particular. So exactly, um, um, uh, the, the not exactly, but the Environmental and Climate Justice Program was started here in Virginia only about three years ago. It's a very new program, and we've been involved in a lot of different projects. There are three main goals and objectives that kind of um, steer um, um, the environmental um, and climate justice program. The first one is to combat the greenhouse gas emissions. And that includes um, advocating for the closure of fossil fuel uh, uh, facilities, as well as uh, coal powered facilities, and to encourage the um, transition to a clean energy economy. Um, the second objective of the environmental and climate justice program is to promote and support energy efficiency, which is, you know, um, it can be um, the way that new buildings are built, as simple as encouraging folks to change out their light bulbs. And then the third thing is promoting sustainability and resiliency. And depending on where you are in the state, that can look very different. In the Hampton Roads, the sea level re uh, resiliency is a big issue. I'm here in Northern Virginia where transportation is a big issue, as well as um, what you're experiencing out uh, it, what your experience in being threatened by these fossil fuel infrastructures that are coming in and these fossil fuel infrastructures um, um, influence the, the rate in which we can actually transition to clean energy economy. So about several years ago, National developed a report called Fumes Across the Fence Line, which is the first report that actually looked at the influence and the effects of fossil fuel um, um, infrastructure um, and its close proximity to African American communities. And this report identified a lot of key things such as the siting of these facilities are race-based um, mm -hmm. because they know there is um, a low level of political support as well as being able to artificially lower the property value, making it easier for the companies to purchase the land to do the projects. 
also um, it identified the influence and impact it has on the health and um, health of the communities, particularly those located directly um, adjacent to the, 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 the project. Um, on average, uh, school children were identified to miss 101,000 sick days per year due to upper respiratory and asthma illnesses. And if we look at the big scheme of things, the environment and our health is our wealth, right? If we can't go to school, you know, if we can't go to work, our health is our wealth. And so for our children to miss so many sick days, um, that puts them at an academic, academic disadvantage. So it's not just our health we're talking about, but the ability, how much it influences our ability for the socioeconomic advancement. And I think, is somebody timing me? Because I know I'm on, <laughs> on a time. So wave me, because <laughs> I can go. I, I meant to set my own timer and I forgot. Am I Oberlin? And so I'll just close and in talking about, um, I'll just cl close and I'll just talk about one key part, which is, um, um, okay, there, it's back. Um, um, what the environmental injustice is just identifying um, um, it, it's trying to advocate against one community to have a such a disproportionate impact meaning all of the ill effects of progress is clunked down in one community and that community does not have economic benefits nor does it have work benefits or anything such as that and is absorbing all of the negative impacts. Um, and I'll just leave it at that and I look forward to the question and answer session. You're still muted, uh, President Ralston. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. And everyone, I hope you're taking, taking uh, notes so you'll be ready to, to ask questions when we get to that point. Um, next is going to be Dr. Mary Finley Brook, who is currently an Associate Professor of Geography and the Environment at the University of Richmond. Dr. Finley Brook's research focuses and expertise includes a diverse range of topics, including climate change policy and carbon trade. Transna transnational forest management and extraction, multi-ethnic indigenous peoples, resource rights in Latin America and sustainability within institutions of higher education. Dr. Finley Brook is also very active within the environmental justice sphere in the Virginia and formerly served in the Governor's Advisory Council on Environmental Justice speak. <laughs> Thank you and good evening. Kay, are you going to pull up some slides or do you need me to do that? Um, so I'm going to be providing my contact information on this first slide and I am happy to follow up with any of you on a, on a later date um, if you wish. I've been asked to address health and safety concerns and I really want to start with a visual image that I hope you can see on that picture of a compressor because they're really deceptive Actually, yeah, the either picture will do fine. Um, unless you have a special infrared camera, you cannot see that there are toxic plumes off these stacks. And once you get the camera on there that can pick up the methane leaks and, and actually these contaminants, you would be shocked at actually what's coming out of a compressor station. So next slide, please. There are a lot of important issues that I do want to address tonight. And so I am going to have to move a little bit quickly and just provide a general overview so that we have the time for the questions. And certainly for many impacted residents, the hazardous air pollutants, those HAPs, uh, Karen was talking about the number of days that kids miss. This is really the greatest impact for a lot of people. It contributes or causes respiratory disease. So if you're talking asthma, COPD, certainly we know um, that it contributes and makes worse heart disease. And we know that the impacts are going to be the worst for children and babies and for the elderly. So people who have pre-existing conditions and for other reasons would already have health conditions are going to be people who are most impacted by compressors. And one of the problems is the way that they're regulated, and we could get into all of the, the technical aspects of that, but 
one of the problems is they do it on an annual level. And with compressors, you get big bursts of pollution, sometimes scheduled and sometimes unexpected. Every time a compressor station gets shunt on or off for cleaning or for maintenance or for if something goes wrong, you're going to get a, a lot of pollution in your community and it's incredibly noisy. So these are, these are some of the major concerns. Other ones are certainly radioactivity. Um, I will come back to that. It, it is the Marcellus gas. Um, there's fires, there's explosions. I'm gonna talk about that a bit. Air pollution, uh, water pollution, and of course these cumulative impacts because you have multiple sites. So you have the Transco compressor there as well. Next slide, please. The main source I want to give you, if you were interested in looking at the health impacts, is called the Compendium. And it is put out by the Physicians for Social Responsibility right there, and that link is active. It's just known as the Compendium. We're on the seventh edition. It covers the entire gas supply chain. And uh, there is a section on compressors. It's not the largest section, but this is the best research. It compiles all current, med this is 2020, medical and scholarly research. I really very much encourage you to read this source. Next slide. Another important thing to know about pigging, uh, about compressor stations is what we call the pigging operations. And so one more right there. All of those signs of radioactivity, when I first started looking at gas and people were talking about radioactivity, I wasn't certain that it was actually as bad as a lot of people were making out. I've been reading the scholarly research this year. It is that much worse than I ever thought. It's coming out of the Marcellus um, zone, and that is where there are higher levels of radioactivity. It is the, through the entire gas supply chain. And what you have when you have a compressor station is something called a metering and regulation station. It's what turns, it controls the gas and measures it. And that's where they also clean. When they clean that, what they pull out is nasty goo. That is my scientific term. It's gross. It's awful. And um, we're often told natural, natural gas is clean, but it's full of impurities. There's all kinds of chemicals that are put in there with it. Um, and so when you get these cleaning operations, it is really quite gross what they pull out. I'd be glad to share this research. Next slide. In my last couple of minutes or minute or two, what I really like to look at is these explosions. And so we have an area, it's called the incineration zone, the area that would be completely obliterated, obliterated if there were to be an explosion. This is the Chesapeake area, the south side connector pipeline that is in the ground. It went right next to a school. Those kids in their classroom, that was a kindergarten classroom. Mm. Um, this woman that is pregnant says, my, I want my baby to be born in a safe neighborhood. She lived right there. So this is the incineration zone. This is in Virginia. Next slide. So the blast radius or the hazardous radius is figured out by the diameter of the pipeline. This is a big pipeline, 36 to 42 on most of the MVP and the MVP south gate and the amount of pressure. That's how far it blows. Next slide. So this was the Enbridge explosion in Kentucky. I don't know if you remember, it was from 2019. The woman who lived right there died. Her family is suing because of negligence. The pipes were not maintained. They heard noises that nobody checked up on and then it blew. This is just an example, um, but certainly we can see uh, if you go to the, the next slide, this is that pipeline. And my colleague at the new school named Stephen Metz mapped out, you're looking at four separate intersections there that he's put together. He mapped out, there's a lot of actual housing clusters that that pipeline would pass. And so in that instance where it blew, it only killed one person. But what if it had gone past one of these areas? You can definitely see there's higher clusters. Okay, final slide, please. So my last slide here is Union Hill, Buckingham, that circle, that was the Atlantic Coast compressor station. And you're seeing the Transco uh, pipeline coming through there. Uh, and what you're seeing, we were working with the local residents, my colleagues and I, we were really mapping out these safety concerns. We were alarmed by the lack of, of safety evacuation routes and the other risk reduction measures. We know the Atlantic Coast pipeline was stopped, but one of the things that we learned in this and that when it went to federal courts and, and the review happened was that Dominion Energy was going to argue that they could not use electric 
compressors, uh, turbines, the motors, there are two kinds of compressor station. One that is extremely dirty and toxic, which is what is slated for your area. And these cleaner electric compressor stations that cost more and are now 20% of the compressors out there. So they said it costs too much. Uh, energy companies are willing to risk lives to lower costs and Virginia law requires the best available control technology. This electric turbine would be the best available control technology. There is no doubt on that. Um, and this is the cleanest technology for your community. If a compressor were to come, it is not what is being required. It is not what is currently in this permit. Um, and DEQ is not requiring it because of the cost. We know that the lives of people in this community matter. We know that they have value. And I really encourage you to be as involved as you can possibly be in this permitting process, because you have to make sure that your community is not getting what, the worst end of what could be coming in the situation. And I'm gonna stop there. I would be glad to answer questions later, but I am certain I'm at way over time. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to trying to get back here. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. I was busy trying to send a note um, at the same time. And next, thank you so much. Thank you. Aren't we learning? Those of us and uh, who, who this is new. And keep in mind, we do have a we have a new um, envi our environmental and justice. Um, com Climate Justice uh, Committee is new and we have a, a, a very informed chairperson, chairwoman, who you'll hear from a little later on. Our next speaker is Mark Sabah. And Mark is a senior attorney with the Southern Environmental Law Center in Charlottesville. He was part of SELC's team challenging permits for the Atlanta Coast Pipeline and handles litigation on a, on a range of water issues. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thank you all for, for being here and, and being, you know, finding out more about this and, and participating in this process. Um, I work at SELC, the Southern Environmental Law Center. We are an organization of 80 plus attorneys um, here in Virginia and in five other southeastern states um, working to protect the right to clean air, clean water, um, natural treasures, and provide a healthy environment for all. Um, we represented the Friends of Buckingham organization in the successful court challenge to a similar air permit for a similar compressor station in Buckingham County that was part of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Um, and I thought um, to give a little legal spin, I would share, you know, a few lessons that we learned from uh, from that case and specifically from that decision uh, from the Court of Appeals that, that threw out the permit for uh, for that compressor station. Um, and, and some of you are very familiar with this, um, others might not. So just a little bit of background. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline developers proposed to put a compressor station in Union Hill. Um, a community in Buckingham County populated largely by descendants, direct descendants of freed men and freed women. A uh, door to door study in that community found that 84% of the residents were African American uh, or biracial, uh, many with respiratory or heart conditions that could have been exacerbated by a compressor station in their community. Um, and the developers of the pipeline, uh, Dominion, and Duke denied for a long time that any uh, environmental justice community and uh, that this Union Hill community even existed. The people of Union Hill organized, they spoke out, they were vocal at hearings before DEQ and the Air Board. They put evidence in the record before the board. Um, the board ultimately did issue the permit for the uh, for the compressor station, but then Friends of Buckingham and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation challenged that in court and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, threw out that permit and issued a decision largely focused on, um, on environmental justice concerns. Um, and so three things uh, that we learned uh, from that decision and that apply here and in, and in other, um, other uh, future permitting processes in Virginia. Um, the first uh, that I'll talk about is in deciding whether a particular site is suitable for a particular activity like a compressor station, 
state agencies are required to consider environmental justice. That was something that was a matter of some dispute at the beginning of that permitting process. And by the end, the state the pipeline developer and the court all agreed that environmental justice was a part um, of that process, of that, of that consideration about the suitability of the particular site. And so what does that mean? Uh, a second thing that the court found was that agencies must make a finding about the character of the local population. The agencies can't, can't just assume that there's a certain community there. They actually need to study it, find out who lives there, and find out the characteristics of that, that community. And here's why that matters. If, as with Union Hill, there is a large African-American population there, for example, then information about um, African-American populations having, for example, a greater prevalence of asthma and other health issues is a really important consideration. And that's one that, that the court specifically highlighted in its opinion, an important consideration in, in making that permitting decision. And, and the last thing uh, that the court held and that I think is really important is that agencies like DEQ and the Air Board must consider whether those living closest to a proposed facility will be affected more than others in the same county, particularly when we're talking about uh, communities of color and low income communities. So it's not enough to say that emissions from a per particular facility will be you know, within state or federal standards. Um, you really, you, because first of all, we've seen that emissions from, uh, that, that even that comply with those standards still have adverse health effects. But also the question is whether there's a disproportionate impact on a, a particular community. And that's what the court said uh, the state has to look at. So that's also why it's critically important that members of the community most directly affected by a particular facility like this one speak up and participate in the process because the, the agencies have to consider those con comments and have to take that into consideration in their decision. Um, so I'll stop there, but I'm also looking forward to questions and to talking more uh, later. Okay, and I'm sure you're going to have some questions because everybody you heard him say they have to ask questions. They have to interview. So um, we'll we'll be back. Anita, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you for stopping the pipelines. Can I, mm, okay, am I? I can hear you now, but you might start your introduction over if you had started it. Okay, okay. are you hearing me okay now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, okay. I will, I will try this. Um, uh, Lynn Godfrey, is the Sierra Club Virginia Chapters Community Outreach Co Coordinator for Stopping the Pipelines campaign. Lynn is passionate about and committed to racial justice and eliminating all forms of injustices. She's a and lives in Chesapeake. Virginia. Welcome again, Lynn. Thank you so much, Anita. Oh, can uh, you Linda. hear me? Did you hear me? Okay. I, I, we, you, you came in and out, but it was good. Thank you. I'm Lynn. I'm with the uh, Lynn Godfrey with the uh, Sarah Club uh, Virginia chapter. I'm their community outreach coordinator for Stop the Pipelines. And to just culminate everything that's been said and trying to get the community organized so that we can, you all will be prepared to address uh, the D, to address DEQ and address the uh, Air Pollution Control Board in a meaningful manner so that you are informed by things that's going to impact you for. Uh, I think uh, my colleagues did an excellent job, hopefully, in, in trying to inform you of the dangers of this compressor station, what impacts on your health, the impacts not only on that, but especially on that, but on climate change. Um, so it impacts a lot of uh, uh, aspects of social justices uh, that is uh, 
deals with, you know, putting, placing these type of infra infrastructures, uh, fossil fuel infrastructures into communities uh, that are poor, disproportionately African America, African American, uh, especially in this region. I mean, we're dealing with, uh, I mean, our organization is dealing with uh, combating uh, environment injustices, we're placing fossil fuel as well as waste management uh, products into four different communities in the state. They all are predominantly African American communities. So it is imperative that you do uh, attend the February 8th meeting. Uh, that's the public hearing that uh, DEQ was going to have. It's virtual and it's going to be next Monday. I have added the link. Uh, the link is in the uh, chat where you can register. You need to register. Uh, it starts at 6.30, I believe it is, but check the time. Register. You want to, and as simple as if you don't understand uh, some of the things that Mark went over as far as what they need to ensure. They need to, one of the things they need to ensure with environmental justice is as simple as meaningful outreach to those impacted, what we call fence line communities. And uh, they have not done that. Even the uh, assessment by, their, by uh, Mountain Valley Pipeline, their paid consultant states that they have not done meaningful uh, outreach. So that point alone is significant to contest. Uh, so February 8th is the uh, date that we, you need to register to make sure that your voices are heard. You need to speak up. You need to go there and at DEQ know that you want, uh, you want more information about how this is going to impact you socially, health-wise, economically, uh, uh, how it's going to impact not only your health, but your children's health, the future generation's health. Um, uh, Karen mentioned, um, I think I provided that report to you, uh, Anita. Uh, fumes at the fence line, which, you know, really, I Friday I sent you that report, and it gives you a great detailed uh, analysis of, of, of an overall analysis of how these fossil fuel infrastructures, oil, gas, is disproportionately placed in communities of color, not only disproportionately placed in communities of color, but the impact that it has to us. And one of the things that, uh, one of the things that the industry tried to combat uh, state and push back is jobs. Uh, you know, renewables is outpacing fossil fuel industry jobs. Uh, that's where we need to be looking at in the future. That's what the new administration is building uh, their, the, 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 their uh, commitment on is renew renewable energy. Uh, providing jobs so the community is well suited for for the 21st century moving forward you know for fossil for industry energy that is not going to uh kill us you know <laughs> it's not going to cause us to have asthma i'm african-american and i you know and just I, I think you know to give you some context i'm sure most african-americans on this call know half of the people in their family has asthma or is impacted with asthma. So those things, yeah. while they're statistics, they are real. They, I know that, I live that, I see that. My daughter has asthma, my nephew has asthma, you know, and it's exacerbated in the summertime. You see these things, you know that, you see the impact on our communities. Then you need to show up February 8th, uh, register. Right now, the biggest thing we can do is get as many people registered as possible. Um, there is also a sign-on letter that is going to be circulated to the NAACP and other organizations. What the Sierra Club and others want to con want to is to have them halt this process because I talked to the um, the I talked to the consultant and she is outraged that MVP uh, misrepresented her mis misrepresented the report. She's outraged. That right there alone should keep, de they need to halt this process. After Monday, they need not go any further. They need to stop it and, and reassess this process. So, but we need to be there February 8th and uh, let DEQ know these things. And just if something as simple as letting them know, we don't have enough information. We need more. You, not, you have not done outreach. It's a pandemic. We're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing with climate crisis. And you living in a um, you know broadband desert. I don't know how many people have access to the internet. All of their 
communications with the community has been virtual. That right there limits quite a few people. So February 8th, make it your business to be online if you can. And if you can't, uh, I need if they can contact me and the Sierra Club can help assist with that uh, as much as possible. So I look thank forward you. to your questions and thank you for the opportunity to, you know, um, sharing this light with the community. Oh, thank you so much. And, and, if, and you all you can go to the, the chat um, for how to register for February 8th. And thank you for making your, yourself um, available to us and for us. Um, and I want to thank the panel. Thank you all um, for such an important um, presentation. And I want to stress the importance of showing up on December 8th. So everyone, please, please, please show up. Um, now we're going to take uh, two and a half minutes to watch a video that was made for the Union Hill community at one of their public hearings for the air permit for their proposed compressor station, a permit which was later canceled, as we heard earlier, by, by federal court. It's entitled, We Are All Union Hill, Our Air, Our Lives. We interrupt our programming. This is an emergency. Important details follow. Just some of the compounds expected to be released from the Union Hill Compressor Station include benzene, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, nitrous oxide ammonia, and particulate matter. You people have looked over us as if we don't exist. You need to be men and women and stand up for what is right. We can only speak what is good for our community. And we want it to stay just like it is. We have become a family. We do matter. The biggest challenge is fighting the propaganda that, um, that Dominion um, that's part of their conversation um, because they do any and everything to advance the initiative for this pipeline. But I would like to ask, when will polluting fossil fuel infrastructure be placed somewhere else other than in minority and disadvantaged communities? When is it not enough? We challenge anyone who's in favor of this monstrosity uh, of the compressor station. We challenge any of those folks to make a commitment to relocate and come into our community and live near this compressor station. Anita, I think you're muted. All right, you got me now? Okay, can you hear me? Thank you, yes, okay. Please. All right, well, I wanna uh, thank you. Thank you, Artivism, for sharing the video. And um, that, that gives us some, some direction. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Ms. Elizabeth Jones, uh, who is Pennsylvania County NAACP's new Environmental Justice Committee Chair.
Miss Jones. Elizabeth. She's got to be unmuted. Yes, I okay. found mute. Okay. We got you now. So let me say hello again and to tell everyone that I'm very happy that we're having this webinar tonight because um, as a neighbor of the Lambert Compressor Station, we share property lines. I am nervous. I am nervous. I am frightened for my family. I am concerned about the value of the property we purchased for uh, what is the term in real estate, um, uh, the quiet, peaceful environment and existence that land ownership is supposed to have. As the chair of the Environmental uh, and Climate Justice uh, Committee with the Pennsylvania County NAACP, I am also a, an activist. This is a civil rights matter. Companies such as MVP that plot and plan for their future don't realize that we have futures too. And this property that we are attached to them, we have no comps, we have no information, except that we've invested $300,000 already in our land and in our home and in our ownership. And as a member of the NAACP, this struggle that we're having now and this fight to preserve the rights of African Americans to environmental justice and civil rights and climate change, because climate change has been here for a long time, it's nothing new, but we've been in a struggle a very long time to preserve the property that we have to preserve the communities that we live in and it's not about wildlife and trees it's about human beings who have invested and who have uh, a need for clean energy clean energy no pollution hotspot but clean energy and a decent community that gains in value that doesn't depreciate like ours has from the uh, sale and leasing to MVP. So tonight, I will be the moderator of the Q&A session that we're having. And I'd like to um, give some ground rules. First, um, I'm asking that everyone give first time and priority to questions from Pennsylvania County residents. If you have a question, you can type it or in the chat or raise your hand on the screen. Once you are called on, you can continue, you can unmute yourselves uh, to ask your questions. Once your question is answered, please mute yourself once, once again. If, you, if you're joining by phone, just wait for a pause, unmute yourself, and ask your question. Opening the meeting uh, for questions is going to be uh, started. We're going to have uh, anyone who has a question to please, if you're a Pennsylvania County resident, try to get in there. You're, you're a priority speaker. And uh, my husband, Anderson Jones, who's also here with me, you might have seen him a bit in the uh, uh, screen. He is uh, kind of concerned too. I'm getting a little uh, more concerned as I listen to the speakers. And I've been to meetings from MVP. Uh, when they first started, they wanted to, they were thinking of using our property. We have a 35 acre farm with Loblolly Pines and a home. And we said no. We had just finished a keep the ban strategy for uranium mining. That's also in Bannister District. Now, Bannister District 
is one of the large districts uh, and it's a minority majority district so that we can get representation from our leaders. I have uh, once again been frustrated by the fact that our supervisor is not meeting with us, passing on information, and I'm so happy that the NAACP is now uh, at this state where we can have this committee and we can discuss this and we can educate the community and collaborate with groups like Sierra Club and um, uh, the groups that have lawyers and who care about the environment. And of course, the state branch of the NAACP, working with everyone, we hope that we can somehow, somehow stop this MVP pipeline and keep our heritage because this farm is 98 years old and it's been in the family for 98 years. I don't want, I don't want to even go through how we got it 80, 98 years ago, but we're waiting to celebrate the 100th birthday in anniversary in 2023. And once again, I, I, I started to say, here we go again, because this is just one more, it's Black History Month is upon us. One more example of the disparities and the injustices uh, forced on us uh, by uh, the system, systemic racism. I'm sorry, I didn't look at the calls or the chats. Um, I don't see any on the screen right now. I don't see any hand raised or any questions in the chat. Uh, if I've missed you, just weigh in. While we're waiting for questions, let me uh, let me highlight what um, Dr. Finley Brook has put in the chat. We need to elevate uh, the permit status to full air board pollution uh, hearing. And to do that, typically the threshold is to get 25 comments. So we want to make sure folks are, um, are, are going to submit comments and we're going to have instructions on how to do that in the, in the coming days. Um, we're going to either have a, a webinar on how to do that, uh, but it's going to be a space to show, teach people how to do that. It's very simple, um, you know, so we want to elevate um, that, the status of that so that we will have a full air, board, air pollution board hearing. So I just wanted to highlight that. And the comment period is open till March 10th, to March 10th. And in that, I'm going to put back in the uh, put in the chat. There is a link to uh, Department of uh, Environmental Quality (DEQ) that has all of that information in there. And remember to register for the February 8th hearing, which is Monday. Hey, Lynn, um, Josh. Yes, here. and through registering. Oh, sorry. Yes, please go ahead. Um, sorry, I. I uh, Per the, Go ahead, please. per the call for questions, um, we did get an email from um, Robin. I'm not sure if they're still with us on the call, but right at the start of the call, we got an email with a few questions. So I just pasted those in the chat for everybody. In the chat? Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, is there another speaker? Josh, you want to read them? I'm not seeing them. Sure. I, well, I think a couple things have piled in there. Um, Robin emailed and asked, uh, where, where will it actually be located and how many acres are involved in this project is the first question. It's going to be located at 987 Transco Road. I'm not sure of the acres. I'm not sure of the acres that's involved, um, but um, that's where it's in Chatham, has a Chatham address, 987 Transco Road. Somebody have their hands up, may have Yes, and can I speak? And as okay. I said in the other one with the hand, yes. 
My name is Mark Joyner, and I'm uh, live in Chatham. Um, I'm the founder of the Association for the Study of Archaeological Properties, and we've been fighting the mainline pipeline for five years since day one. Um, and we know their tricks that they're going to play. One of the biggest problems that Transco itself has right now is that whenever they change the um, uh, the pressure stations in Houston, Texas, it blows all the triple redundancy relief valves all the way up the line right to transcode where they eject VOC, which is the model organic compounds, into the air over 300 feet. And with the wind blowing, the prevailing winds, that blows right across into Chatham. And I've been out to the Joneses property because we did their tobacco barn many years ago. Um, and they now are going to have the compressor station on one side and the pipe in the back of their property that runs along um, Halifax Road or the old uh, Chalk Level Road. They have already built the um, interconnect station to Transco. They did not need a permit for that. Pennsylvania County requires that in order to build their uh, compressor station, they have to get a permit. But they're going to find a way to get around this like they've done everything else. In order for them to bury the pipe in Pennsylvania County, it's in their bylaws. Anything wider than 40 feet, each property must have a, a validated permit for them to bury the pipeline. They excluded having to do that because they never did that in the 1960s with the Transco pipeline. So they just said, well, we're going to exclude MVP from having to get those permits. They're going to end up doing it again. Um, I've spoken with Mark Vaughn um, at DEQ. They right now don't really have any way to handle the VOC, the, uh, the bottle organic chemical, or what's called the GHGS, which is their fluid storage tanks. They're not really sure what they're going to do. Um, their main station is going to be approximately 45 acres just for the compressor station. The interconnect station that's already built is adjacent to and connecting to the Transco line itself or I should say uh, to the Transco station. We have probably every month there's an accident out there at Transco. We have a neighbor that lives a half a mile from the station. Um, and every time they have an accident, he calls 911 because they're venting gas, you know, 300 feet up in the air. Anybody driving by with a cigarette or bottle, bottle rocket or firecracker, boom, off it'll go. They have gone over to his house and threatened him and told him, you do not call 911. You call Transco first. This is one of their ploys to scare the neighbors and people that live along the path of the pipeline. Um, so I guess if I'm going to have a question, my question is going to really be, uh, to sum it all up, because I could talk for an hour on this whole subject, um, <clears throat> is what is the real need for the Lambert Station? Transco already runs from Chatham down to Burlington, North Carolina. Now, they now want to put in this Lambert station right next door to Transco, which is a major mistake for a high-end high explosive. They want to run parallel to the Transco line all the way to Burlington, North Carolina, in competition with Transco. So there's really no, no need for public use for this secondary pipeline. But so that's my question is, why are we even bothering to have them try and build it? They're putting the cart in front of the horse when they haven't even been able to finish the main line yet, because they're now missing two of their federal permits. They have to now get a permit for each and every individual creek crossing, and they're still mired up in lawsuits and everything else with over 300 violations of environmental acts. So I just, I, I heard, don't Mark. understand why we're building it. We like to say um, the only need is greed. Um, but I see Katie Whitehead has had her hand up for quite a while. Elizabeth, would it be all right to call on Katie? But let me respond yes, to him right fast. This is Lynn. Let me, that is a comment. He can make that. That is a question that we need to ask DEQ. That is a question that we need, that needs to be brought up in a comment to DEQ on, on Monday. So he's absolutely correct. You don't know. We they need to tell us. Mm -hmm. May I go ahead? Yes, Katie. Um, I I can speak to Robin Gord's um, first two questions. So, MVP owns two tracts of land adjacent to the Williams Transco property, 
One to the west is an 80 acre piece and one to the south is a 154 acre piece. The 80 acre piece um, is where they have their interconnect with the MVP mainline. In November of 2011, they sought rezoning of that 80 acres from agricultural to M2, and they succeeded in that process. The 154 acres, which is directly south of the Williams Transco site, um, is, is A1 agricultural. Um, in April of 2020, the Pennsylvania County Board of Supervisors changed the county zoning code, adding a fifth exemption to the zoning code. So the first ones were for things like railroads, telephone lines, some power lines. Um, but the fifth one added in April exempts pipelines, compressor stations, and related facilities that have been um, permitted, you know, reviewed and approved by FERC. Um, so I think that answers a couple of those questions. Wow. Yes. Well, I, I plan on being uh, one of the persons in the webinar questioning Q&A with the, the DEQ on February 8th. And my question ties in also with one that my husband has, because we've seen the lack of community um, betterment. We have no benefits. Right now on Transco Road, when you turn from Chalk Level Road, there's a sign that says, a warning sign that says rough road. And I'm sure that goes from one end of Transco Road to the other. There also used to be a, a docked highway sign where Williams Pipeline had adopted the entire stretch of uh, Transco Road. So we were getting some community benefits, but currently, we're driving down a rough road to get to our property when before this new pipeline, new pipeline and compressor station wasn't there. And their efforts at helping the community are nil. I don't know who they're helping, but as uh, was said by one of the speakers, it's greed. Greed meets need. And Lambert, Compressor Station, MVP Pipeline have not been good actors. Are there any more comments? Q&A, questions and answers. I see it, uh, Katie no. Whitehead has her hands raised. M may I say something quickly though? So that, uh, uh, because it, 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 it's, um, it's, it's 828. And um, to honor everyone's time, I, I just want to take a moment and thank the panel and all the guests. Um, and but we can stay on another 15 minutes if if you have more questions. Um, but for those that need to leave and, and sign off, um, please uh, be in touch uh, with us, uh, with the Pennsylvania County NAACP, and with um, Artivism. And the information you already have. Um, our contact information. So, um, and if you would like to have additional public education meetings like this one, and if you would like to receive future emails on this issue, and um, it's so really, it's very important uh, that you register for February the 8th public hearing. So, and we'll, we'll continue on for those who want to stay and, um, you, if you need the email information, I think it's mostly in the chat and you have mine. Um, so I'm sorry, Katie, and for those who want to stay on, go ahead. Um, I, I, this is, um, I want to 
um, suggest that as as people have said, it's um, appropriate to comment that you don't know um, much about this. That that in itself is a reason to um, deny the permit at this time. Another um, reason, which I think Mark Sabbath may be able to speak to, is the timing of this permit. This, um, the MVP Southgate project, which includes this compressor station, is for a pipeline running south from um, Pennsylvania County. It depends completely on completion of the MVP mainline. And I'll, um, uh, 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 Mary Finleybach, I don't think you'll mind if I correct you that the main line is 42 inches. The, the Southgate project is 24 inches and then shifts to 16 further south. But um, 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 North Carolina DEQ denied a water permit on the grounds that this project depends on the MVP mainline. Could, Mark, could you um, could say more about that timing? Yeah, and so that is, I mean, and that that denial by North Carolina of the water permit is now has been challenged by MVP, and, and we're you know, we'll be waiting for a decision from the Fourth Circuit on on that on that case. Um, th there is a question about uh, about whether here. That's, that same sort of consideration could be um, a reason for the board to make a certain decision about this permit and what, what authority the Air Board and DEQ have here to, um, to make decisions about this permit based on what's happening with MVP mainline. That said, th these are all, you know, you know, if there are concerns, if there are comments, if there are specific things that that you have to say about, uh, you know, about this permit and specifically about how it, you know, affects you, something that, you know, that you can say that other people can't necessarily. Um, those are all good things that are worth bringing up uh, on the 8th and, and as the comment period continues. Sorry, Ms. Royston. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is really informative, I tell you. Um, I have a question for you. Earlier, you said that um, they have to uh, speak to or, or um, uh, in order to evaluate uh, that there's a consultant that is supposed to gather information and talk to the, the people who are going to be affected who are in the area. And it was said that the consultant was upset because they were not able to complete the, um, the, the survey or their um, um, assessment because of COVID and others, and I heard that other um, reasons. So if the consultant did not complete the process, then don't we start over? Shouldn't they have to start over where he or she left off before? I mean, they, how can you get a permit if you haven't done the assessment? I'm confused. Can I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Let me add, the, what, the, the, what, the, the, the assessment is complete, okay, it's complete, but it's inadequate. So I think that's a, a, dis, a, that's a, diff, that's a distinction with a difference. So okay. it, it's complete, but it's inadequate. And she uh, notes the inadequacies on several different things. So go, go ahead, Dr. Finnegan. Sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. The other thing I would say is you have to understand why they're doing it. And I really hate to reduce it to this, but it's a box checking exercise. And the whole Fourth Circuit Court said environmental justice is not a box checking exercise. If you've looked at how they've done that report and the way that they twisted the findings of it and the way they left it completely undone, what we saw in Union Hill with the archeological studies and a lot of these other studies is they actually had very high quality people go out and do the research and say we have a ton of questions there's a lot of issues this is completely unresolved there's a lot of next steps and then the company says done assessment done archaeological EJ done so the point is not actually to figure out the end result and to do I think meaningful engagement which we know has to happen with environmental justice they just wanted to look like they had done better than previous and then check 
that's how these permits happen. Is it one step above how things were done in the past, then we're gonna say we are the best out there. This is really the best. Well, well, I, I, I can say that the Pennsylvania County NAACP will be submitting comments. Um, and we know they're due by March the 10th and we've already started. So this is, this is serious and I wish even more people were um, uh, listening and I'm glad it's being recorded because um, my question has always been um, too, why do we need another compressor station if, the, if one is already there? Yes. Yes, May I jump in again? Okay, um, Elizabeth, uh, the Anderson Please. family, whatever, they could probably um, confirm this, but on the 80 acre site, when they first started the construction, uh, or took possession of the MVP Southgate property, there is a African American cemetery there on the property. They were told that they had to put a construction fence around yes. the cemetery and make sure that they've determined the size of it they no longer will allow us access to get into the property to monitor that cemetery, even though the cemeteries are public property for anybody to have access to at any time. But they're refusing to let us do it, and their big trucks have been running five feet, ten feet away from this cemetery where the roadbed is. So maybe maybe Elizabeth and mm -hmm. Alonzo or whatever, yes. they can confirm. I've been there. Uh, yeah. Anderson Yes. I've been there. They have not done anything to the grave site. But I'm very confused because, you know, I've had problems with Wilson Pipeline because Wilson Pipeline used, and that has been a problem. And now my neighborhood, I think I got about three people have died already with cancer. Uh, one uh, fellow got throat cancer now. His mother passed away and his, and his brother passed away maybe about two years ago. And I'm very concerned because we got this run of a terrible smell that come out of that pipeline and, I, and, and I'm not close to it, I'm a little way from it, but still, why do we need two compression stations in this area? Cause it, it would be a no man land. No one can leave, be living here anymore. Our water gonna be polluted. And I'm very confused because I wanted to keep that land, but my family got involved with that and they, uh, I think, they showed a lot of money to them and they sold it and they gave it to them. But I did not sign anything for that because I told them that was wrong. And if they had went down a hundred feet, 300 feet on the south side of Cherry Stone Creek, they would not have been on my land. They would have been on their land that they bought. But like I say, I would like the compression state to, to stop completely because my family gonna move down here in their later the, the days, my, and, my, uh, and they can move down here. I would like to have a decent place to live. And right now, it's not going to be any place for no one to live. And you should see how my beautiful farmland, the Jones land was so beautiful. You should see it now. It's, it's just a wreck. And when I ride my buggy around, I can't ride on, on, on my land anymore because they have made so many mounds from eight to maybe 17 feet tall. And it's very ugly and just messed up my farm, my, my family land. And I'm very hopeful that we can stop it completely because I can't live here. And Anderson and I, when I go, go down to the farm, the rest of the acreage is about 63 acres. And he checks on those kinds of things, uh, the cemetery, uh, what's been done, what's been moved, and we're not happy with the fact that we have five-story uh, tall logs that are laying there that they've cut down. We're not happy. We, we see the uh, detriment to the land, but it is um, something that they got paid for, and this is something else they seem to be telling us. Oh, we're spending millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, yet our neighbors sold their property. We don't know how much they have, they got. Our, our um, family gave interest to an easement for the pipeline. We don't know how much they got. Nothing's a matter of public record. 
So mm. the bad actors are merely going along. I'm not saying I want to sell mine and Anderson and I, we're not looking for money, but what we are looking for is information. And tonight has been really a benefit to us because we're so happy to have collaboration and uh, others in the community who want to make it a better place. And we know we have energy. We've got, oh, what is it? The world's largest deposit of uranium in Bannister District. Now we've got three compressor stations and that's still fossil fuel. We're still trying to get rid of that. And if we had green energy jobs and green energy resources in the county, I think we would be, um, it's, a, it's a, an uphill fight to uh, control land use when corporations want to make profit. So we're working on it and we're so happy to uh, be working with you all. Thank you so much for all that you do and uh, have done and have shared with us. I just joined the uh, NAACP Environmental Justice and Climate Change uh, Committee and I'm always willing to uh, support my community and work for civil rights because African Americans uh, do suffer many health issues and poor people. Don't let me leave out low income people because um, that's where these kinds of uh, energy sources uh, start their businesses. They don't go to Beverly Hills. They, they start right here in Bannister and locations where uh, they can exploit. Because people are not speaking up. It's like it's, people are asleep until the noise starts to wake them up. And then you generally think it's too late. But um, um, Mark, are you telling us that at this point, because they're already they're already scheduling um, and letting it be known that later this year um, they'll be creating about 1,200 jobs and um, they'll generate an estimate of uh, 1.2 million dollars in new tax revenue every year in Pennsylvania County. Um, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Which mark are you asking me? This mark. Sabbath. Are, I mean, are, are you asking me about the, their claims of the jobs that it will bring to the... Mainly, what? no, the main thing, I'm just saying this is what's being said, but um, we might, people might feel that it's, it's too late in the game. How late in the game was it to, uh, to stop it when, uh, with Union Hill? It, it, it is... It, it's not too late in the game. Um, I mean, with, with Union Hill, the, the permit was actually issued, uh, but there was all that participation during the comment period. Um, and that, you know, in addition to, you know, having the possibility of changing the mind of the decision makers, even if it doesn't, that builds the record, that builds, you know, energy and momentum that, that uh, can be used in litigation or in, in, in other efforts, you know, even if, it get, even if it gets to that point and the permit gets issued. But, um, but we're not, we're, you know, we're not there yet. We're still in the middle of this two-month uh, comment period that goes through March 10th. Okay, thank you, uh, everybody. You know, President Ralston, hi. I just wanted yes. to add one little thing to your comment about adding all of the different jobs, and that is definitely one of the top, you know, manipulation techniques in which these uh, projects um, um, and, and used to be able to get in. And of course, they also rely on um, communities, um, um, uh, low income communities, communities of color, not to have that political support and not have a champion willing to stand up and fight for them. And, you know, definitely echoing what Mark said to your question, it's never too late, um, is just trying, you know, get in. Um, um, folks together to say um, this project, it, we don't want it in here and here's why. And one of the key things um, that um, um, Pennsylvania will be able to talk about is the cumulative impacts that will happen where, where there is already existing um, declining conditions due to infrastructure and, and adding this new project is going to top that over. And so a lot of these permit, and, and, and somebody can correct me on this, or maybe even 
say it a lot more eloquently than I, who are, um, have more expertise in this area, but you know that cumulative impact um, assessment is so important um, to highlight, to say this community is already unhealthy, this community is already suffering, and bring in these additional emissions, bring in, and we didn't even talk about the noise pollution that these compressor stations are bringing in. And there are numerous studies that show just how these elevated, consistent elevated noise has on not only the psychological, but also the physical health of, 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 of the humans, of the animal, of everything around in that area. So there's so many different impacts and, and, and just stressing that one word cumulative is so important. And also I'd like to put in the chat um, for, for your reading, um, about a year ago, NAACP National created a report called Fossil Fuel Fuelery, and they talked about the top 10 manipulation techniques that um, these corporations use in order to be able to get the one up during the permitting process and to manipulate the process in order to get it in their favor. And it's with some of the techniques that we talk with the artificially lowering of property value, the discussions of bringing in these great high paying jobs and everybody's gonna be trained and all of these things. And, and, and these are not the case, as well as just, you know, building the relationship with the local um, elected officials, so that was it. Oh, thank you. We can go on. We can go on for another couple of hours because I am feeling so empowered that I'm ready to get out there and fight. And remember, our slogan, our national slogan was, um, when we fight, we win. And we can use um, Union Hill as an example and all these powerful people who just spoke to us and empowered and fed into us. And, and we have people right here on the ground. We have Katie, we have um, Robert, we have the other folks that have just spoken, and I'm sorry, I, don't, I am not real good at always remembering names. I should have written some down, but you know who you are. And um, I am so looking forward to uh, the meeting. Uh, Elizabeth, I know you're going to pull together a, a, a meeting right quick, um, and you, um, we can always do it on the phone or um, space out at the radio station. It's, um, and, and I want to thank, I want to take a quick moment and thank you, Suzanne. Nice to meet you. It was good to, uh, we did the, the interview on the radio and a few people heard that, quite a few. So anyway, we're learning and we're on, we're, we're in a hurry, but we don't want to miss a step. So as someone says, don't stop, keep fighting. Yes, keep fighting, but we're going to do what we can do. So if there's, if there's, Nothing else. Um, final words from um, Kay. Did you want to say something before we sign off tonight? And I'm thanking everyone for um, being a part of this um, webinar. Um, I just want to say that um, I'm so honored to be here. Um, Art of Vision Virginia is, and many of the other organizations represented here by your panel are ready to help. Um, the, the, the ability to win on this kind of thing has changed so dramatically in the last four years, and it's changing for the positive every day. Uh, when we were working with Union Hill, we made a practice, and it became a little joke, to always say the proposed compressor station, mm -hmm. the proposed pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, because language is powerful, and we need to understand that it's not coming there. It's not going to be on your fence line, Elizabeth and Anderson. It's not going to happen because we are going to stop it. Right on. And thank you, everyone, for being a part of the webinar. And um, until the next time, we'll, we'll keep fighting. Bye-bye. <laughs>